Hey guys, I just wanted to take a second to ask that if you gain any valuable insight from this episode, that you please share and leave a review. We truly appreciate all the support and would love your help to spread the word. Enjoy the episode. Ideas are welcome here, but execution is worshipped. Everybody talks and very few people build stuff. I was never the smart, not even close to the smartest person. I just actually went and got it done. It's amazing what you can get done when you just actually just start. get stuff done. You just get it done, right. Yes. You'll adjust along the way and you'll figure it out, but. Success is not a destination. I thought it was the destination. Everyone's trying to get rich or famous. Success is not a destination. It's the platform that finally lets you do the things that actually matter, right? So you work hard to get to success. The success, it's nice, you celebrate it, but the truth is the fulfillment doesn't come from your house or your car. The fulfillment comes from creating a legacy of doing things for other people that you couldn't have done if you weren't successful as business. I found I was much more fulfilled running around with these families and helping their children have a better life than I ever was buying another car. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. Finally, we've been trying to do this for a while. I'm glad to be here. I am so excited to be here with you. It's been almost a year of us, I think, trying to do this. Yep. Trying to do this. Getting into the same so, city at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Easier said than done with your schedule and mine, but thank God here we are. Well, I mean, you travel to country after country, city after city. I mean, do you ever spend time at home? Um, not enough. Uh, when I do, I'm wiped out by that point. But, you know, our entrepreneurship nonprofit, uh, I'm proud of our team to say we're now on the ground in 200 countries. So uh, I don't, we have a paid staff. I'm the chairman of it. But for a board chair, I'm super involved. So and that's I'm, Jen, it, the Global Entrepreneurship Network. Yes, Network. Global Entrepreneurship Network. And, and I will tell you that for me, and you've lived the same life, right? The, the key to the life we've been blessed to live was our decision to be entrepreneurs, to just build stuff ourselves, right? You would have so many similarities in our story. And <clears throat> so I wanted to return the favor to entrepreneurship um, by giving back. And when I decided the one thing I know how to do, like you, is build stuff. Mm -hmm. And so... The commitment was, I'll teach as many people as I can how to be entrepreneurs so they can build their futures, right? And that's what it's about, building the, the life you want and the future you want to live. And so real quickly, the simple mission statement of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, it's a nonprofit, is to help anyone anywhere start and scale a business. But it's not about business and money. It's about freedom and independence. Take care of yourself, your family, your people, your city, your country, by turning ideas into profitable businesses. And we now teach that on the ground in 200 countries. That's phenomenal. How do you, t literally, how do you teach <clears throat> that in 200 countries? Is so, it through events? So it is. The answer to your question is every and any way we can. Um, so we do events around the world. I was just recently in Australia where we had our annual, we call it the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. You definitely should be speaking there next year. I would love to. Um, and... At that event, we invite entrepreneurs from all 200 countries. We do it once in a year, once a year in a different country every year. And we spend that week having entrepreneurs educate other entrepreneurs and then networking because the people mm -hmm. from all over the world. We do things like we host Global Entrepreneurship Week, which, by the way, starts next week. Last year, we asked people to hold any entrepreneurship event where you live, a pitch competition, a mixer, a party, anything that supports entrepreneurs. Last year, we had, during this week, 40,000 events held across 175 countries and 10 million people attended. Oh. So we're trying to create awareness for entrepreneurship. We have a lot of online content to help entrepreneurs. We have a global investor network to help entrepreneurs and startups. And then last, maybe you should come judge this with me sometime, we hold something called the Entrepreneurship World Cup. Um, it's like Shark Tank except across 200 countries. At the same time. Yeah. Yes. In fact, here's what, here, last year – we had four – well, this year. Sorry, this is the end of this year. 45,000 startups in all 200 countries apply. So we hold Shark Tank pitch competitions in 100 countries simultaneously. At the end, we took the 100 best startups out of 45,000 across 200 countries. We flew them all – we flew them all to Saudi Arabia. And then we judged the finals, and we picked the best startups in the entire world. So wow. it's a super – the coolness of the event is it restores your faith in humanity. All over the world, 
people are innovating and trying to make the world a better place. And we're just blessed. We started this. It's our fourth year. We've now had, <laughs> it's crazy, but we've had 400,000 startups over four years apply uh, to our pitch competition. So what we get to see is what is everybody in the world doing? Mm -hmm. These innovators all over the planet. And it's exciting to know that with all the bad news in the media, there's a lot of good news and a lot of good people out there. Well, our audience is filled with entrepreneurs, predominantly in America, but aspiring and current entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, people who are trying to get there. For them, what is the criteria for that pitch and what does the winners get? So we actually give out millions of dollars in cash because this is a big event. But we give out, I think, actually like $200 million in in-kind services. So everything from – the biggest thing, though, just like if you were on the TV show or whatever, is exposure, right? The people that make to the final 100, we, we broadcast that show, the finals, all over the world in all 200 countries. We bring investors in from all over the world, media in from all over the world. So they get exposure – uh, you know, like you would on Shark Tank, except in 199 more countries than Shark Tank. Um, they get uh, mentoring. They're in our network, um, and we mentor them. We provide connectivity, and we provide in-kind services like web services, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the answer to your question is it's a lot. Yep. I mean, the, the mentoring alone is the most valuable asset I just heard. <clears throat> you know, for me, I think that because of – I think I guess all the mistakes I made and time I wasted early in my career from not having a mentor and then later all the 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 value I got out of having a mentor um having been there both with and without a mentor it made me realize that when I'm done building companies I need to be the mentor that I wish I had and just the same way you do that and the same way this show does that yep. for lots of entrepreneurs. I mean that's amazing. The Global Entrepreneur Network. What was was that an idea you had for many years that you finally just started, or what was the impetus for creating no, it? That was actually <clears throat> the founder of that. The guy with the had the idea uh, was was uh, uh, now he's family to me, but Jonathan Ortman's. Jonathan came up with the idea, um, and so most of the time in the world when people uh, come to me, it's because they have an idea, but they don't. So I have this sign on my door. My whole CEO life, I've been a CEO since I was twenty four, like you. And the sign of my door said, ideas are welcome here, but execution is worshipped. Everybody talks and very few people build stuff. When people say, oh, Jeff, you've been successful. You must be smart or something. I was never the smart, not even close to the smartest person. I just actually went and got it done. I just started mm -hmm. and executed. So um, It's amazing what you can get done when you just actually just start. get stuff done. You just get it done, right. Yes. And, and um, you'll adjust along the way and you'll figure it out. But so – in the same sort of vein, when Jonathan had the idea, not me, I was one of the people he called and said, we want to build this thing, help us build it. So most of the time people call me, it's because they don't know the bridge between idea and execution. And, and that's the space that I live in. Let's build your idea into a business. Yeah. So with the group, there's this 45,000 <clears> apply. Obviously, it's in tons of different languages. So yes. there's got to be interpreters involved. All over, yes. It's fun. Yeah, that sure. part's fun because you learn a lot about cultures. Yes, and what regions are doing what. Yeah, exactly. You see what the world is worried about by, by that geography. In this region, they're all trying to do blank. They're all worried mm -hmm. about agriculture, right? We think of entrepreneurship as heavily tech here. In some parts of the world, let's go across Africa, they don't have anything to eat. So they're entrepreneuring in food production so they can eat. So as you're seeing all these businesses, how do you – Dwindle 45,700. <clears throat> what is that criteria that the Global Entrepreneurship Network's really looking for? Is it, I mean, is it sustainability? Is it viability? Is it profitability? Actually, all of the above. Um, and, and there's another element of it, too, which is we're gambling on the jockeys, not just the horses, right? We are trying to develop entrepreneurs. So your first, you know, I can tell you, speaking for myself, I've had some really dumb ideas <laughs> that failed, right? And then on the other side, we had Priceline.com, Boogie.com, Ubid.com, things that worked. Um, so if my failure, which before we ever launched Priceline, I had done something really stupid that failed. If failure had shut me down as an entrepreneur, I never would have got to those other things. So we're developing people as much as we're developing companies. So that's part of the criteria. All the things you talked about, is it a sustainable solution? Is there a real market for it? Is there a value equation? Is this a business or just a cool idea? 
all those things matter. But part of it is, is this an entrepreneur that we want to back and invest in? Because, you know, you've created a bunch of companies as a serial entrepreneur. We want to find people like you that are going to keep creating and innovating, not just a a one-shot deal. I'm so glad you said that because I find uh, too many people fall in love with the business idea and forget to realize it is the jockey. Yeah. A good jockey will take any idea and make the most of it, and a bad jockey can take the greatest idea in the world and run it into the ground. I I had these entrepreneurs came into my office. They gave me their whole pitch, and then they handed me a business plan, and I put it in the middle of the table. And I said, let's all watch the business plan for a while. And they're like, what? I said, just watch it. And it's like game show clock ticking. (laughs) And they're all staring at it. And one of them finally goes, Mr. Hoffman. And I said, what? And he goes, the plan's not doing anything. I said, exactly. Because no one in this room told me any way, anything you are going to do to execute that. Right? You have a bunch of ideas and no actual executable plan. And and as you know, a – an average or below average entrepreneur, even with a good idea, they're not going to be able to pull it off. But a brilliant innovator, even if their idea is not good, you and I, we can help you with the idea. What we can't do is rewrite your DNA. So completely agree with you. We're looking for rock stars because they'll create many times over. So speaking of rock stars, <coughs> what, are, what are some of the attributes you look for when you are identifying those individuals? Because there's no science here. No, nope. it's a mixture of art, it's an and, art science. and science. Yep. yep. So, what are those attributes that you kind of look for, just with um, your experience and background? So, uh, one of the there's a bunch. Um, first of all, humility matters a lot to me because people with a big ego that think they know everything don't listen and they don't take guidance. Some days, and I know you've been there too. Somebody's like, "Hey, Jeff, can I get some advice?" And I give it to him, and I look at him like, "Why did you even ask me? You have zero intention of doing anything I said." You were only hoping I would confirm what you were going to do anyway. So humility is important. Are they listening, right? Coachability is important. One of the biggest ones for me is empathy, meaning do they – empathy meaning that that when you have employees, how deep are you into those employees? How much – if I asked your employees, how much does – are you just here to work for Jeff because he needs you to complete his mission? Or is he equally as concerned with your career, your life? And he wants this to be a great, uh, a great experience for you. Empathy is what brings the best employees because they want to work with someone who cares about them, not just making them feel like I'm an employee who achieves Jeff's dream. Right. Um, and the same thing goes with customers, that empathy thing. You're actually listening to the market or you think you're smarter than the customer, right? I see people that are frequently blinded by their own brilliance. That doesn't work. That's the mistakes I made when I failed. It's because I thought I had a great idea. The customer didn't, and I thought I was smarter than the customer. I didn't think that consciously. I realized later. So empathy is another example of one of those. Do you really listen to people? When you do, you'll be a way better leader. Do you think everybody can be an entrepreneur? I do not. Um, And I don't think everybody has to be. Um, Some people, you know that old saying, being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff and trying to build an airplane on the way down. Some people are terrified by that, and in fact – that's the DNA of risk tolerance, the DNA of, of either being scared by the unknown or being excited by it. As entrepreneurs, there's no doubt you and I have been frightened at some time. Like, oh, my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> I might have made a mistake. I jumped off this cliff. I don't have any tools and I'm plummeting to the ground. But we're equally as excited about the thrill. I spent my whole life like you have throwing myself off of cliffs and saying, whoa, wonder how this one's going to go. Not everyone has that DNA. Not everyone should be an entrepreneur. People always ask, are are entrepreneurs born or made? The answer is both. How do you get made by listening to a show like the Jeff Minster show, right? If I had had your show, this podcast, I would have been taking notes every episode and I would have learned stuff that would have made me a better entrepreneur. But if I didn't have that DNA of risk, if I didn't have that DNA of recovery, when you fail, shake it off and start another thing, I would have never been an entrepreneur. What in your childhood <clears throat> prepared you for entrepreneurship? Um, honestly, mom. Uh, I grew up in the Arizona desert with a single mom. We had four kids, three jobs. And mom's solution to everything was uh, kind of blood, sweat, and tears. Just go figure it out. What do you have to do? Go get it done. So she didn't want to move us. Later, when you're adults, you're like, mom, if I'd known you were working three jobs because you wanted to keep us in that school district— we would have never let you work that hard. 
But instead of complaining or settling, mom's answer was, I'll just start another company, do another job, because I have a goal, and the goal is to have my kids in this school district. So watching that, watching someone that says, here's a goal, and here's the hard work required to achieve it, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to grab a shovel and start digging, yep. that was the inspiration. When you want something, get it. Go work on it. Did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Not at all. I never, <clears throat> ever used that word. Um, I knew a couple of things. So I had one corporate job at a software uh, – I'm a software engineer at a, at a big engineering company. And one day, my boss went to the board and he laid out the strategic plan. And he said, does anyone have any questions? And I was only going to raise my hand. And he said, Hoffman. And I said, I don't even know where to start. Nothing in the entire plan makes any sense at all. And all my employee, my teammates are looking at me. And he goes, I have a question for you. I said, what? He said, does getting paid Friday make sense? <laughs> and my, all my teammates are elbowing me. Just say yes. I said, yes, sir, because I live paycheck to paycheck. And he said, then maybe you should shut up. At that moment, I was like, I cannot do this. I just want to live in a rational world that, that where we work on things that make sense mm -hmm. and that the customer drives the process and not my boss. We should be working for them. And so that corporate thing didn't work. So that's one reason. I didn't say I want to be an entrepreneur. I said, I can't live like this anymore. The second one, be honest, is my whole life I've been told, you're the most Im impatient person I've ever met. And I've been hearing that my whole life. And in 700 years of living, I will be honest, Jeff, I've made roughly zero progress. <laughs> I am still the most impatient person in any line. But it's also the characteristic, inefficiency drive me nuts, mm -hmm. right? Laziness drives me nuts. Wait, and so those are the causes frequently of long lines is inefficiency and competence. So I became an entrepreneur. My first startup really experience was standing in an airport waiting. Back then you had to check in with a human to get a boarding pass. The line was more than an hour long. I missed the flight. When I was 20-something years old and broke because it's after I quit my one good job, I had no money, no job, Some broke, right? I said 20-something years old. I stood in line an hour and a half, missed the flight, and I was like, this, I'm yelling at the ticket agent, this is insane. We're standing in a line an hour and a half long so you can print boarding passes. It's a printer, right? Put the printer over here. I'll get my own boarding pass. I stood there and I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm never doing this again. So I went home that Friday and today the boarding pass, you all, hopefully all of you, have used a check-in kiosk in an airport pretty much anywhere in the world. That was the first product. If I wasn't so unfixably impatient, <laughs> I never would have done that. Which is brilliant because truthfully, <clears throat> problems are the foundation from where innovation yeah. comes. And when we look in our lives, you know, I, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurship classes around the country at colleges, and one of the most common questions I hear from them is, how do you find your purpose? How do I find what company? Because I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what. Yeah. And well, I want to hear what you tell them. Well, I basically go down the path of you've got to figure out what problem is so big or so, dis so important to you that you want to solve. Okay. Or some issue that you want to solve or some idea that you want to create. Absolutely. And... When people, to, to add on to that, so yes and, I totally agree, when people say, how do you find that thing? As an entrepreneur, I know how meaningful it is to invest in the people and causes that are close to me. And on GoFundMe, it's easy, safe, and powerful to do just that. Whether you're supporting a family member, friend, local business, or charity. And whenever you make a donation, you're protected by the GoFundMe giving guarantee. Visit GoFundMe.com today to help make a positive difference in your community. Hey, fitness fans, ready to crush your fitness goals? Make your move to EOS Fitness, where becoming a member starts at just $9.99 a month. Gyms are open 24-7 and packed with the latest gym equipment to keep your workouts fresh. What are you waiting for? Give them a call, drop by, or hit up jefffenster.com forward slash EOS to join. EOS Fitness, better gym, better price. Now, let's get after those goals. It's the <laughs> hardest part of being an entrepreneur. It, yeah. It's the issue that creates that you that is created with your closest family members because what they fail to realize is when I'm hanging out with my kids, I don't look at the clock. Right. When I'm hanging out with my wife, I don't look at the clock. When I'm working on my business, I don't look at the clock. Yep. So I lose myself in time. Absolutely. what I'm doing because I love it. Absolutely. That's and if passion. you don't, 
do something else. Yeah, you're going to lose. Right. You're, you're going to compete lose. with someone who loves it. Yeah, who loves it more than you, so they're going to put more into it. And I try to teach people that all the day in, mm-hmm. when they're hiring people. I always tell them that uh, people driven by passion and purpose will far outperform people driven by paycheck. Oh, yeah. So when an entrepreneur says, I'm launching a business, why? Because I want to get rich. I'm already way less interested than someone that is completely passionate and totally lost. Quick story. When I started that kiosk company, I look back now and I realize what it should look like, exactly what you just said, where you never look at the clock. So I'm working on these kiosks for the airport, right? So you can check yourself in. A buddy of mine comes in. He goes, Jeff, I told a friend of mine what you're building, and he wants to give you some money to build the first prototypes, right, for manufacturing. And I said, great, go get the check. And he said, well, I'd love to, but there's a problem. And I said, what? And he goes, you, didn't, you don't even have a bank account. And I was like, I don't have time to, for bank accounts. I've got to make these kiosks work. And I said, go get me a bank account. And he said, Jeff, I'd love to, but there's another problem. And I said, what? And he goes, you don't even have a company. And I said, oh, my God, I don't have time for companies and bank accounts. I want to make the kiosk work. If you're not so obsessed, the center of your universe is the problem you're solving. A company is this necessary evil that you have to build to deliver a solution. But your focus should be on a solution. And today, people call me and they say, good news, I'm an entrepreneur. I said, what does that mean? They say, I got an office, I got a website, I got a business, right, card or whatever. I was like, you have everything but a problem to solve. It should, you should be lost in the problem, not the business. And I'll, I'll share a, a similar story on my own side. I started Everbull, <coughs> had sold a few companies, made plenty of money. It was one of the biggest fights I've ever had with my wife. Mm. About three months in, I'd been working seven days a week in this restaurant, trying to hear from my customers, figure this whole business out, do this thing. And she yells at me and says, you're a millionaire working a, a minimum wage job and, and not spending time with your kids or your wife. And that was basically the theme of what she was so upset about. And she's right and she's wrong. And I try to explain to her, I'm like, right. once I commit, <coughs> this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I have to be all in. And in this season, in the moment of my life, my kids are good. My wife yeah. is good. Our relationship is strong. Just give me, give me the runway. I will work my way out of it, but right now I have to live and breathe this thing. And it wasn't the money because I wasn't making right. any money. It, it was just more of figuring it out and understanding how this whole thing works. And that's where entrepreneurs, in my opinion, struggle because they are chasing the CEO job instead of understanding that they need to do every job. Yep. They need to understand every element of their business, and they need to understand that that will be the foundation where success happens. And you said something else about oh, I'm doing it for money, and I say this all the time. Don't chase money. It'll run. Yeah. Don't strive for perfect. You'll never be it. It's like bowling. Strive for remarkable. Aim yep. to do the same thing over. Sometimes you'll bowl 300. Perfect. Sometimes you won't. But strive for remarkability. Embrace what you're doing. Have a bigger purpose. Work your tail off to do it. And the money comes. I, I, I have a saying that I tell people all the time. Same saying as yours. But what I, I wrote it on the wall one day. I wrote, don't chase money, chase excellence. Money follows excellence. Mm-hmm. People that are chasing money are distracted by the pursuit of money from the only thing that's going to make them wealthy, which is excellence. You have to focus, just like you did with Everbowl. You, when people today, uh, they're, it's a brand new company, right? They're at the start, and they start telling you about their exit strategy. And I'm like, exit strategy? What is your entrance strategy? What are you exiting <laughs> your PowerPoint? You're shopping for cars because you've made a PowerPoint already, yeah. right? And you're going to buy a new car. Um, I never had a quote, exit strategy, what I always had was an excellent strategy. Go out and build something amazing in the world, which takes that obsessive type of commitment to it and passion, and the money will just knock on your door. If you're focused on the money, you'll never be creating excellent because you'll be distracted. So in today's world, social media has glorified certain entrepreneurs. Right. And the idea of entrepreneurship. It's now sexy. When I was coming out, you know, the word didn't even, I didn't even know that word. It was business owner and employee. Yep, agreed. Entrepreneur was, I learned Not about that like 10 years ago. It's like, oh, entrepreneurship class. That's an interesting, well, actually, I really had it was negative, Jeff. I told somebody once I'm an entrepreneur and they winked like, oh, we get it. You're a hustler. Yeah. I was like, I'm not selling drugs. And they're like, oh, you lost your job. So you're on, <laughs> on the streets hustling. Yeah. I said, this is my job. And they're like, oh, no one will hire you. I was like, I hired myself. So yeah, entrepreneur used to be the negative version of hustler, but please go no, on. No, yeah. And, and in that vein- You're seeing so much young youth being attracted to the idea of entrepreneurship, of what it can bring from wealth and freedom of time and the stuff that's glorified. The stuff that's glorified. And I've yet to see a group 
whether it's an entrepreneurship class or even these masterminds that I, I have the privilege of speaking at, they talk about it. A lot of it is on mindset. A lot of it is on execution. And, you know, I'll talk about vertical integration or relationship capital, all these concepts. Yep. But no one is really spending the time to really lay into what are the sacrifices that you have to be ready for. Because everything has a sacrifice. A everything. Cost. Nothing worth having in life comes easy. Correct. By definition, you're going to sacrifice. And I say, I don't want my daughters to be entrepreneurs. Because I don't think the sacrifice, unless they were wired the way I am, and I don't, just don't think they are, I don't think the sacrifice justifies what they're chasing. Okay. It, I 100% agree with you. This is not for everybody, and everybody shouldn't do it. But I, I, I'll tell you, I'll add something onto that, right, with, with many years ago um, with my daughter. The mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make, here's what your, your family, and by family, it might be friends, it might be parents, it might be spouse and children, whatever. The people that are around you that want your time, that's the use of family I'm doing right now. What they see is all Jeff ever does is work. So their interpretation is all you care about is money, right? Because work equals more products, more growth, more sales. And so the mistake I made until I learned it later is engaging them in the purpose. And by the way, just going to be real here. If all you care about is getting rich, probably neither of these Jeffs are going to work with you anyway. <laughs> right? We care about people that actually want to do something with their success. So at one point when my daughter made a comment about the work, at, you know, the amount of hours, the things I was working, um, <clears throat> I took her to out on that Saturday to a sports field. On that sports field, I asked her to help me pushing kids in wheelchairs around in a softball game. And a lot of these kids had, when you think of wheelchair sports, you actually think of wheelchair basketball, but you know what you have to be able to do to that? You need arms. You have to shoot a basketball. Mm -hmm. You can't be blind to play wheelchair basketball. You can't be a quadriplegic. So at this event, there were kids of every disability. The, when it was a blind child, we brought out a beeper ball. Other kids, if they were couldn't use their arms, we pushed them around. So we were out there on this day playing softball with this bunch of disabled kids with my daughter. And she was having a blast. And she said, what is this? And I said, it's a national league of sports for the most disabled kids in the country. And she said, whose league is it? And I said, I'm the chairman of it. And she said, all these sports wheelchairs are really cool. And she said, where would all these kids get these wheelchairs? I said, I bought them all. And she stopped for a minute. And she said, you created this league? I said, yes, because I wanted to give the families whose kids have the worst disabilities a game on Saturday, like they're able-bodied children. And they needed wheelchairs for, a, it literally was called adapted sports, but none of these people had money. So I bought like 200 of these wheelchairs. My daughter just stopped, looked at the kids, looked at the families. A lot of families were in tears to see their child on a sports team. My daughter said, is this why you're working so hard? I said, yes. I said, if I don't spend some time at the office. None of these, this league doesn't exist and none of these families have wheelchairs. And she nodded and you know what she said? She said, next time you need to work the weekend, can I come in and help you? Oh, wow. What a cool revelation. Seriously. So make sure you share she? with people, probably 12, share with people why are you doing this, right? Mm -hmm. There's probably something you're trying to achieve with your life that is the reason you work that hard. If you tell people, they're not mad anymore. In fact, they want to help you do it. That's brilliant. That's brilliant because I don't. I think you're right. I mean, as someone who has kids and a wife, I don't think I've done a great job doing that over the years. Not because more, more mostly because I don't think it was on the forefront of my sure. mind to consider. It wasn't that. for me at the beginning. Yeah. So I I, I learned that and got there. But um, yeah, just for all entrepreneurs listening, why are you doing this? First, you need to answer the question yourself. And if the only answer is money, that's one of the things that it's okay to do, but it's not enough. Because mm -hmm. of what you said, Jeff, the sacrifice, if all you're getting for that sacrifice is money, really? You traded relationships with your family for money? No, but if you're trading something that enriches your family relationships, after that, every game, she wanted to come help. Yep. She's like, I'm so glad the company's working because we can, we can provide all these families with something. And she was part of it. She and, saw and, the connection. And money is such – if you don't have money – <clears throat> people have attacked me, uh, attacked me is the wrong word, commented negatively when I've made comments. Then they say, well, if you have money, it's easy to say what you're saying. Listen, I understand. We live in America. Money is the modern day requirement yeah. 
to survive. It's the scoreboard it's for a lot of people. And right, you have to have it. You, you have gotta, to have it. You got to eat. You got to eat. So if you don't have money, you I'm gotta not talking to you. You got to eat at Everbowl, by the way. Yes. That's what I meant to say. Eat at Everbowl. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting, when I say money, I'm saying if you're just chasing money, if you need, if you need to feed your family, you need to do what you need right. to do. That's a requirement. That's the foundation. Right. This is for the people who are chasing the idea of becoming a millionaire. Yes. And are turning down or have the opportunity to make a good income, but they just want to be rich. Right. And the reason they want to be rich is for fancy cars and fancy houses Correct. and the idea that they think it's going to ful- give them fulfillment. <clears throat> and from experience and having the privilege of getting to speak with extremely successful people and be friends with them, 99% of the people I know who are millionaires, the money doesn't fill their cup. It's the impact like what you just talked about yeah. with the wheelchair league and the ability to make positive yeah. impact on the We're planet. We're in 200 countries now helping people. That's why I worked this hard. I Correct. didn't always know it then. But I'll tell you, like you, I was... 20 something years old when I sold my first company. And and we sold our company again we're not what here to talk about it, but we sold our company. I was broken unemployed in 20 something, quit my job and we sold that company for over 100 million dollars. And everybody's in the rat race every day for that is what I was told. That's the social messaging, right? And so all you're you're broke. I was literally driving a used Hyundai and the next day you can buy Ferraris, Lamborghinis, whatever. But What happened to me in a good way was disillusionment. So all of a sudden I had money and I'm being honest, on day one I went out and bought stuff because I never had stuff ever. I grew up poor. But on day two almost, I'm not literal, right? I was, wait, that's it, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody's in the rat race for this. And I said, this can't be all it is. Because after the newness, the shine literally wears off the fancy car or whatever, um, after the disillusionment hit, I was like, this can't be all it was for. Right. And so I learned a super valuable lesson. I learned this that success is not a destination. I thought it was the destination. Everyone's trying to get rich or famous. Success is not a destination. It's the platform that finally lets you do the things that actually matter. Right. So you work hard to get to success. The success, it's nice. You celebrate it. But the truth is, the fulfillment doesn't come from your house or your car. The fulfillment comes from creating a legacy of doing things for other people that you couldn't have done if you weren't successful as business. I found I was much more fulfilled running around with these families and helping their children have a better life than I ever was buying another car. I just didn't know that till I got there. And the hard truth is the kind of human that can create the companies that generates, creates and generates that kind of wealth, they're wired in such a way that they can't sit on a beach anyway. Yeah. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> that's that's the re- like so many, so many people I listen to say, you know, I just want to make millions of dollars so I can retire and sit on a beach. If you are wired, if you're not wired to not be able to do that, the chances are you're not going to create that. I, company. I completely agree. Elon that, Musk, that's Bezos, a DNA thing. Gates. You look at all of the glorified entrepreneurs, the biggest ones in the world. They're still working yeah. their tails off, doing different things, having an impact, right? Changing but the world, I, impacting I, the world. I agree. It's funny you say that. I was smiling because. Uh, Somebody once said, what superpower, what superhero you would be? And I jokingly said, but not jokingly, I would be nap man <laughs> because I literally have no ability, right? I, I, I know how important sleep is to my health, and I was bad at it for a long time. But you know what's crazy about that DNA? For a long period of time, if I did go lay on the beach, an hour later, I would feel guilty like I was committing a crime. I was like, I could be building something. I could be helping someone, and I'm laying on the beach. I got over that. I found some balance there because, as you especially know and talk about, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't help other people, right? If I'm not healthy, I can't do those things. But you're right about that DNA. I was like, yeah. we, you know, I go to the beach with a bunch of people, and an hour later, I was like, well, I see you guys tomorrow. I'm going to go find something to do. It's just a DNA thing. Well, and, and like some of our mutual friends and very extremely, you know, celebrities people know at home, so it's easy to use those names, but you talk about the Drew Breeses, the Shaquille O'Neal, <clears throat> the people that have made enough wealth to never have to do anything that they don't want to do, but yet they're some of the busiest humans I yeah, know. exactly. They're involved in more charities, more businesses for profit, more businesses for impact, more speaking engagements than a lot of the people I know who are struggling to make ends meet and are hanging out all day Saturday drinking beer at their house. Exactly. I was uh, uh, Pitbull, the singer, is a good friend of mine, and uh, I was at his show recently. And what I love about attitude, people always say that guy never stops, right? He never stops moving. But what they don't understand is 
We're backstage. It's time for a pit bull to form. There's 30,000 screaming fans. He doesn't say, I want to go out and soak up all the adoration uh, of my fans. What he says is, I'll be back in a couple hours because this is how we build. A, more, more kids get to go to school the more times I go out on that stage. He actually relates his busyness and his performances. He builds schools, right? And, and we've done that together, uh, building schools. But I love that he doesn't say, mm -hmm. my fans are waiting. What he says is, there's children that need an education. I need to go out on that stage so I can provide it. Why is he so busy? Because he's driven by purpose. Yes. And I think it's important, and this is not to, this is just to reiterate that point, but we're filming this on a Saturday afternoon at 3.30 after we both spoke at a, I was gonna say another after we event. Both took our Saturday to speak at someone's event. And both flew in yesterday <clears> to do <throat> all that. And I, I, I'm saying that because if you're looking for those attributes, if you're sitting here listening to this and you're saying, I'm not yet where I want to be, what changes do I need to make? What do I need to tweak? I'm telling you, it's changing, the changing from activity to productivity. Because yep. cool. you can well, run like in place all day. And way. so many people spend so much time saying, I'm so busy being active. But they're not being productive. And I'm that is the difference. Even more excited that you said that because I literally posted something on my social media re recently because there was all – I'm so glad you brought this up. This is going to be my favorite part right here. Um, there was all these influencers that were saying, if you're not up at 4.30 a.m. every single day of your life, you're just not trying hard enough and you don't care about yourself. I completely disagree with that. That's the difference. That's activity, yep. productivity. And people brag, a badge of honors to say, I'm an entrepreneur. I get up at 4.30 a.m. every day and I work till midnight. That is not a badge of productivity. That is a badge of inefficiency. Yep. I used to tell my team not we should be up at 4.30 every day. What I wrote on my social media was grind when you have to. But don't grind for no reason. Don't grind so you can tell people I'm grinding every day. <laughs> grind for productivity. So – what I used to tell my people when, when these influencers are saying, get up at 4.30 every day and do something, I would say, let's figure out how to do in two days what it takes everyone else the whole week to do. We'll probably still work a regular week, but we will crush you in productivity because we figured out how to do what you were doing all day. The flip side is when it's your kid's birthday and you want to take them on a trip or you want to go out and push kids around in wheelchairs for a couple of days, I focus so much on productivity that I can take three days off and I can go do the things that I want to do. So grinding when you have to is fine, but fi but your point about activity doesn't count, only productivity does. And if you can improve the efficiency of your productivity and get it done in two days, you should go spend this Friday with your family. You don't need to be in the office because mm -hmm. you were so productive in the four days before. I that. love that. Grind when you have to. Because if you are just grinding all the time, you are just being active, and you tend to do the things that don't move the needle, Yep. and you feel better because you're doing something. Because you're doing something, right. And that's a dangerous place to be. It is. And, it's and treading water, and that's not going to get you to the shore. It is not. You dropped in the water. You've got to pick a path, and you've got to swim hard. It is so glad you brought that up. When somebody said to me one day, people that work for you, how much vacation do they get? Somebody has asked me, how many vacation days? I said, infinity. Mm -hmm. And they said, how do you give your people infinity vacation days? I said, because I don't ever count any of those things. And they said, how does that work? I said, I only measure productivity and results. So if, Jeff, you're working for my company and you are crushing it and you say I'm taking the family uh, to the beach for four days, I was like, have a nice time. Call me if you need anything. I never question because I'm only measuring results and productivity. If you're crushing it, do what you want to do. If you're not, you're fired anyway, so you're never <laughs> going to use infinite vacation days. Right. I, I'm not judging the activity. I'm judging the results. What did you produce with your time? That's what you should measure as an entrepreneur, people's actual contribution, not the activities they were doing. What did they actually get done? And even if you're not an entrepreneur and you're an employee, it's the same, yeah. same thing. It's in anything in life. No one except children, get the benefit of I worked all day trying <coughs> and I had no productivity right. and results because we're teaching children to be adults. Right. But once you're a grown-up and you enter the real world, you're based. it's all based on productivity. It is. And the people, the companies, the organizations that are the most productive win every time. Efficiencies. Yep, completely agree. Probably and why the, Priceline was so successful. It, it was we were, we were focused on finding rock star producers. Yep. Hey, everybody. Looking for great insights? Entrepreneur.com's podcast network is the place for you. 
Check out podcasts like Problem Solvers and Smart Passive Income for smart advice. Hear true stories on how success happens, financial updates on dirty money, deep dives with Behind the Review, and food trends on restaurant influencers. And don't miss my new show. It's all at entrepreneur.com forward slash listen. Let's start our success journey today. Hey there, it's your host, Jeff Fenster, and I have something very exciting to share with you today. You know, here on the Jeff Fenster Show, we're all about growth, both personally and professionally. Speaking of growth, have you ever heard of Everbull? As the proud founder of Everbull, I can tell you firsthand that we're on a mission to help everyone unevolve, to live actively and eat stuff that's been around forever. Imagine stepping back into a world where everything you eat is fresh, nourishing, and packed with nutrients. At Everbowl, we've got you covered with our wide range of superfood bowls. But it's not just about the food. It's about a community of like-minded individuals who are determined to embrace a vibrant, fulfilling lifestyle. Join us on this journey as we redefine what it means to be healthy and active. So if you're ready to unevolve and be the best version of yourself, head over to everbowl.com and check out our menu. By the way, you know, I always tell people this, that I tell people, that you can't build greatness on the backs of average people, right? And so here's the conventional wisdom. I'm going to use dumb numbers. You have 100 bucks. An average employee costs 20 people. So you're like, with this $100, I could hire five people because an average costs. And then I introduce you to my friend Jeff Fester, Fester, who's a freaking rock star. And you're like, yeah, but Jeff costs $50. I can't afford rock stars. So what they do conventionally is they say, for this same money, I could hire five people. And that's where it goes wrong. If you took your $100 and hired two $50 rock stars, they will far outperform the five average people. And the reason people tell me they don't hire rock stars is they can't afford them. So what I'm telling you is hire way less people, spend your money on rock stars, because those people will deliver the results that you need to win. And to piggyback, you can't afford, you, you can't afford not to hire rock stars if you want to be successful. Yeah, complete. And that's what you... In, Success is a derivative of the, of the specific things you do, right? You show me what someone does, and that's the outcome. Yep. I know no matter what you do, you will find success because you have this formula, innate, con- subconscious, or conscious. Do you have a set of core values, or I, I say core values is a, another way of saying it, but a success formula that you're very clear on, like this is what Jeff Hoffman does? Uh, absolutely, and I love that at the conference you and I were speaking at earlier today on stage – you said success is formulaic, and I would have run up on stage and give you a high five right then because it is. And it's the reason that I was able to leave tech, go into entertainment, a music company, a film company, and people were like, what are you doing? You're a tech guy. You can't be in the music biz. And what I said that you and I agree on is I'm not a tech guy or a music guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I know the formula of business success, and I'm going to apply it to different industries, right, because there is a formula. It's the same thing that, that in sports, it's the fundamental blocking and tackling. I remember one day, um, <clears throat> uh, an athlete, but I was on the phone with Derek Jeter, the baseball player, and he said, I got to go. I got to go to practice. I said, dude, practice? Aren't you the best baseball player in the world? And so the thought would be, why would the best baseball player in the world practice? And Derek's like, I'm one of the best baseball players because I practice every single day, right? He said, that's how you get here. It's not the other way around. Yep. Because I've never stopped practicing any day of my life, no matter how many games I win. That's what makes you good, that that commitment um, to that work ethic that other people just don't do. Yeah, and you know Kobe Bryant, <clears throat> one of my favorite athletes of all time, but not because of the per- product on the court, but actually the Mamba mentality yep. that he spoke about and what made him him. He used to always say, I committed everything to this craft because I never wanted to look back and say, I wish I would have given more. Man, that's, that's the that's pretty profound. It's profound. And when you look at your life, when you look at what you're trying to work on, whether it's raising the be- being a, the best parent you can be, being the best husband or wife, being the best entrepreneur, being the best friend, brother, sister, it doesn't matter what initiative you're after. If you ever look back and say, I wish I, I, wish I would have done more, it means you didn't leave it all on the field. I, and Derek Jeter left it all out on the field. I, I, 100% agree. So when you were asking me about that formula, yep. what's the formula for success? It starts with habits, right? And that's why I said that uh, <clears throat> in sports, what Derek told me was every morning I hit like 200 grounders that I field for a shortstop side, and then I do batting practice, take 100 swings. 
Um, <clears throat> he works on the fundamentals of the game that make him a better player. Business has fundamentals. So I'll just cover a couple of them since you asked that formulaic. Um, one of the ones I learned the hard way is surround yourself, because we've been talking about rock stars, surround yourself with people smarter than you and then serve them. Fundamentally, when you, if you were to ask your child, right, if your kid came up to you and said, are you the boss? And you'd say yes. If you were to then say, what do you think I do? The child would say, you're, a boss is the one that tells everyone else what to do. That is the mistake, right? Real leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. I got that wrong. I'm the CEO. I'm the founder. It's my company. I'll tell people what to do. I didn't grow or succeed when I did that. I started to grow and achieve something significant when I realized that my real job is to find hire people smarter than me and then just take care of them. You want to create the company where the best people in your industry all want to work for you and never want to leave. So your real job isn't being the boss. It's an inverted pyramid. Your real job is finding rock stars and then taking such good care of them that they never want to work for anybody but you. And that's, I learned that one day when I sold a company and I was on TV and they were saying, Mr. Hoffman, they were reading our margins, profits, sales, all these numbers, amazing results. What, what are you, what accomplishment are you most proud of? And on the way to the TV studio, Jeff, the woman that ran HR for me called me and she goes, this is so cool. I just finished verifying it. She said, Jeff, from the day you started the company through all these years to the day you sold it, she said, no one that worked for you has ever quit. And I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever that done, and I don't cool. know how. <laughs> so I started calling the employees from the TV studio, why don't you guys quit? And they're like, dude, is this a problem? Do you want us to quit? I said, no, but so I must have done something somehow that no one ever leaves this place. And I said, let me grab a pen and tell me why you don't quit. And I said, I'm going to listen to every single answer, and then next time I'll do it on purpose. And what I discovered was my job wasn't as a leader to run the company. My job was to find people smarter than me in every area and then take really good care of them. That's when I achieved growth. That's brilliant. And that's so profound. And I agree. I mean, I think I shared on stage my moment of having that yeah, same no, I epiphany uh, when I was younger, realizing that my ego was actually making people leave. And yep. today I hire people smarter than me. I'm the dumbest guy on my team. And I try to bring in thought leaders. And that's why some of the companies that we have have turned out so incredible because of the people, the team that is on At uh, 100%. And that's the formulaic part. Yes. When I said I'm going to start a music company and everyone's like, you're a tech guy, that's not going to work. I'm like, I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to play an instrument. I'm not going to write the music. In the same way that when I was doing travel, a company like Priceline, I am hiring systems engineer, engineers and developers, right, because we're building algorithms. This time, instead of systems engineers, I'm hiring guitar players, drummers, Right? Instead of a guy that writes code, I'm doing a guy that writes song. How is that different? It's not. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm hiring the best people at every position on the team. And then I'm just, my job is to go out and find rock stars, in that case, literally, um, <laughs> and then take really, really good care of them. So that's one of the formulas that I was like, why would that not work in any industry? And we kind of had the chance to prove our thesis. So I heard you say something <coughs> actually today, uh, earlier, that. When you were at Priceline, someone once gave you what should have been a great compliment, but you internalized it very differently, and that was that you were the world's leading expert on travel. <laughs> yeah. And I was sitting there listening to you have this conversation, and I absolutely fell in love with your response, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear that, it, that story. It, it, it was kind of funny because the story is that I was backstage getting ready to give a speech. I'm getting mic'd up, and the, the host of it was introducing the world's leading expert in online travel. And I was like, I'm in online travel. This is the one speech I need to hear. I need to meet this person, right? And I was a little upset. I don't want to be trapped backstage. I want to go meet the world's leading expert in online travel. And while I was trying to look out and see who it was, the curtain opened. And I had this realization. I said, oh, no, it's me. <laughs> they're, uh, they're calling me the world's leading expert in online travel. And the, it's funny because my first response was disillusionment. I was like, wait, if I'm the definition of a world's leading expert, then everything I've ever believed about experts is questionable <laughs> now, right? Because if I can get that title, clearly anybody can. Um, but it, it, it led me to a thought process. I, I started thinking, why did anybody ever call me that? And the answer is thought leadership. And I started backing up. And, and so for everybody, 
Um, uh, thought leadership is about no one's going to invite you or ask you to do this, right? Um, I just wrote an article one day, and I wrote an article called The Future of Travel, how you were all going to travel one day. And then I called every media publication, and 100% of them said, do not send it to us. We do not accept unsolicited submissions. Send us nothing. And so I sent it to every one of them. <laughs> and uh, one day my phone rang, and, and this woman said, are you Jeff Hoffman? I said, yeah, why? And she said, did you write this article? I said, yeah. And she said, and you sent it even though we explicitly told you do not send us any articles? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she said, I said, why are you calling? And she said, well, it's actually brilliant. She said, this is the first, you've written an article on the future of travel, and I want to run it. And I said, who do you work for? Well, this is the cool part. She said, I'm the travel editor of USA Today, which at the time was a huge national newspaper. So on the front page of USA Today, they published an article called The Future of Travel. So the irony is, or the funny part is, I was called the, world, the leading expert on travel because I'm on the front page. I'm only on the front page because out of the blue, I wrote an article and just planted a flag. I said, here's how it's going to be. And so thought leadership is so important because you know what happens next? You get a chance to walk the walk because it was on the front of USA Today. Everybody in the travel business called me. I'd love to chat with you about the future of travel. You know what I'm really doing? I'm learning what it actually is, even though I wrote the article, <laughs> saying, what do you do? I'm, I'm a CEO of an airline. Tell me your plans for the future. Pretty soon, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because I planted that flag, everybody came to the flag of world's leading expert, mm -hmm. and I actually became it because that caused all these people to reach out to me. Well, that's an incredible story. And like I said, I love the fact that you actually tried to see who the world's leading expert yeah, was, was when it was you. I mean, that, I, I that was just like goes to show you the, the character that you have. <laughs> so I have two final questions. All right. One <coughs> is going to be a little harder <coughs> for you. I'm assuming just pretty much. Track record. Pretty sure we agreed on no hard questions. Yeah, this one's going to be hard though. Okay, I might have to bring in a consultant or something. You, you might, because right. with the totality of your rich background and successes from being a tech entrepreneur to the music industry with you know Elton John and NSYNC to Global Entrepreneurship Network in 200 countries impacting people all over the world and all the philanthropic awards you've, won you've received from Disney and your entrepreneurship background. What is your single greatest accomplishment to you? For me, okay, outside of personal, right? Yes. That, that'll always be family. Professional, right? but, yes. Um, <clears throat> professionally. Which is why it's a hard question because you've done so many great things. My, professionally, my single greatest accomplishment, and I didn't realize this till a little later in life, my single greatest accomplishment Wait, what? Single greatest accomplishment. accomplishment. Yes. Um, I don't know why you guys put vodka in these things <laughs> for your guests, but it makes the end of the talk a lot it funnier does. 40 minutes later. Um, the single greatest accomplishment I realized later was watching the people that I raised, that I brought in, hired, trained, mentored, um, educated, and supported every way I can. It's watching them succeed. And I didn't think about that because – I've been very blessed that um, a couple of weeks ago, I got na I got this Global Disruptor Award for disrupting philanthropy on a global basis. And in theory, not disrespecting it, it was a really cool award. People flew in from all over the world to give it to me. That's all great. But I remember the feeling that that just, even though I respect and appreciate that, I would never be disrespectful. When I see one of the people that I brought in and shaped and grew and educated get an award like that, I'm way happier. Mm -hmm. So seeing the people that I've helped raise go out there in the world doing amazing things, that's my biggest accomplishment. Somebody said to me, you don't have that many social media followers. I said, because that's not my goal. Mm -hmm. I said, if you want to see my followers, I'll give you a list of people that I've mentored and tried to bring up all these years. Go look at their followers. And that's it. You and I have a mutual friend. Um, in Southern Cal, Austin Eckler, yep. right? The running back. Um, Great like, guy. Like you, Great I, football I, player. I talk to Austin all the time. But because of the person he is and the person he's becoming and the person you and I both know that he wants to be, when he accomplishes accomplishes a next-level reserve, I feel like I just did that, mm -hmm. right? And And he made some history recently being only the – third player to hit 30 touchdowns and 30 in the history of the NFL and 30 receiving TDs and 30 rushing with the same team. I actually felt like that was my accomplishment. <laughs> the people you love, the people that you help, 
when they soar to levels above you, that's actually the stuff that just lights me up way more than, again, not being disrespectful, way more than the stuff that I've done. Well, I love that answer. And again, that just goes to your character. So my last question is going to be on this pivotal moment in human history, entrepreneurship today versus where it may be going with the growth and everything around AI. Do you think AI is going to shape the workforce and what we can do as entrepreneurs in a positive way or in a negative way based on your understanding as a successful tech entrepreneur? Sure. And so uh – this is going to be a funny thing to say, but I've been in AI for like 30 years. I went to the college I went to specifically to study AI. So I've been in and around this uh, forever. So now I have to put a disclaimer. The disclaimer is you and I as op- entrepreneurs are the eternal optimists. You and I always think we're going to win. Yep. Right? I don't go out on the field one day. I was telling this people, talking about attitude. And I said, did you all ever hear the story of the World Cup? Brazil was in the World Cup final. And in the locker room, the Brazilian captain called the team together and he said, guys, let me tell you something. He said, I actually hope we lose the World Cup final because it'll make us better people. And everyone said that really happened. And I said, never (laughs) and hell no. (laughs) Nobody ever went out on the field and said, I hope we lose because it'll make us better people. Right. You and I pretty much Mm -hmm. always think we're going to lose sometimes, but we always set foot on the field thinking we're going to win. So I have to. I have to say that because I am the eternal optimist. But my answer to your question is, in the end, the good guys will win. AI will have bad results, just like the internet has bad results, just like a ring doorbell has Mm -hmm. bad results. But in the end, I fundamentally fundamentally believe that the power of of the tool and the technology will be harnessed by the right people to do more good for humanity than it does bad. There's always a bad element because that has nothing to do with AI or ring doorbells or the internet. That has to do with bad people. And unfortunately, it turns out they're not going away. So we're always going to have to fight off the bad actors, but I believe that AI is going to wind up being a hugely positive uh, force that helps a lot of people in a lot of places. Well, Jeff, I could honestly spend another three hours having this conversation with you because I love the way your mind thinks. I love what you do. I love what you stand for. I see so many incredible attributes that you bring to the world through your entrepreneurship endeavors, your philanthropic endeavors, how you truly are the same person on air that you are off air, which Thanks. for everyone watching, if you haven't, you, you, you obviously know the body of work from Jeff Hoffman. You may not follow him. You may not follow him so on social media yet um, because as you said, that's not been your purpose. Not my but goal. I can tell you from... The incredible humans that we both know, your reputation is remarkable Thank in this you. society. And everybody who knows you loves you, adores Thank you, you very much. and speaks the highest level about you. So I think that that's a testament to the fact that you are the same person on air as off air. Thank you. And I want to, A, commend you for that because there's not enough of yous in the world. <laughs> but number two, <coughs> I'm so excited to be more have our friendship be stronger and deeper and be more involved with all of your endeavors. And I want to put it on air that if I can ever be of service to help and take part, you have it, you heard it here, I'm in, and I will go all over the world to help and share in that mission because we need to make more entrepreneurs. We need to make more people achieve success. We need to teach everyone that formula. And so if you're struggling to find that formula, you've really got to follow Jeff Hoffman. You've really got to get into the, his mind because he is creating millions and millions of successful people around the world through everything he's doing. And it's a testament to who you are. So, man, I want to thank you so much Thanks, for Jeff. coming on the I, Jeff I Esther Show. really appreciate that. And listening to you speak at that event today, uh, we are the same person in so many ways. So I want to tell you, we need to find more things to do together. And in the end, when one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how do you pick the people you mentor or coach or just work, partner with and work with? And the answer is this. If I believe that you would use your success to bring up, to reach back, take the hand of people behind you and bring up more people I want to work with you. And you've never not done that. So I hope we find more places to partner and work together. And thank you for having me today. Thank you all for tuning in. I want to give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsor, Entrepreneur, for partnering with us to help get this show to as many people as possible. Go check out our article on the episode at entrepreneur.com or by clicking the link in the show notes below. See you on the next one.